All right, uh, good afternoon and welcome to uh, this afternoon's webinar on introducing planning insights. Uh, we'll be getting started in just a few minutes. Uh, we'll be uh, wait for a few more folks to join. Thanks. So I'm sharing my PowerPoint, right? I'm just, I'm not doing two screens at the same time, <laughs> as well as Zoom. It's a little bit of a new experience. So there's my disclosure for the day. <laughs> You're good. Right. Well, on, uh, on that note, I think we're, I think we're ready to, to uh, to get started. So uh, without further ado, Lee, kick us off, please. All righty. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. We are so very excited to finally being able to present to you Planning Insights. To kick off the call today, we owe a very special thank you to Navaplan by Advicent for their dedication to financial planning and for being our inaugural sponsor of, of Planning Insights. So today, Tony Stitch has been able to join us from, uh, from Advicent. Tony is the COO and thank you, Tony, for joining us and we, we look forward to your contribution to our discussion this afternoon. I also want to offer, take a moment to offer special thanks to some dear colleagues, uh, Frank, Noreen, Paul, and Doug for joining us today and sharing and being willing to share their successes and their best practices. So we sent their bios out earlier today. And so I'd love, I'd love for you to take a few minutes to look at their bios, get to know these planning superstars and, and you'll hear from them in just a few moments. But at this point, um, I just wanted to uh, turn the meeting over to Tim for just a few minutes for some logistics. So Tim. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Lee. Uh, welcome again, everybody. Um, uh, Lee is going to um, introduce our panelists in a moment, uh, but first I wanted to let all of you know uh, who've joined us in the audience how uh, you can be a part of today's conversation. Uh, we've given you a couple of ways to, uh, to jump in and ask a question or share um, some aspect of, um, uh, of what you're doing um, in, this, uh, in this area. Um, uh, the best way to join us is by clicking the raise your hand button, uh, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, that will uh, actually allow you to join the panel um, uh, using audio or uh, also using video if you're, uh, if you're set up to, uh, to, to do that. Um, uh, that way you can, you, know, you can jump in, you can ask your question, you can have any amount of back and forth that, uh, that, that you would like to have. Um, another way uh, for you to get a, a question to our panel today uh, is by using the chat function. Um, uh, we will uh, all be keeping an eye out for, uh, for, uh, for questions that come in via chat uh, throughout uh, the afternoon. Um, and do feel free to uh, send any questions to me via chat as well if you're, uh, if you're having any, any, uh, any trouble. Uh, I think that that, uh, that that just about covers it. Sounds great. Thank you, Tim. Okay, so I want to jump right in. Um, we've got a lot to cover today. Um, let's start first, though, with an introduction to what Planning Insights is. And so Planning Insights is an annual benchmarking service, and it's to help firms understand how their advisors stack up compared to, the, to their peers. Um, so it really what it's going to also do is help a firm understand if they are a leader or a lagger, lagging, if they are leading or lagging in financial planning. Um, it is going to be helpful for firms to set meaningful goals so you can understand where you are now, so you can set measurable, uh, reasonable goals. Uh, and it will also help you to determine whether or not you need to deploy more resources to develop better coaching and training. So 
Why do we want to improve adoption of financial planning? It's really, that's a bit beyond the scope of our call today, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of our previous work. Uh, Karen Bielan research has continued to show the benefits of financial planning, and you can find um, our research at carabelan.com, but um, it basically, we are consistently showing that advisors that adopt a financial planning approach outperform advisors that don't. And we actually have, you know, even more strongly than that, advisors that adopt a financial planning process produce twice the revenue as those that dabble in it. So um, again, if you wanna see more you know, of that research, please visit our website. Um, so let's go ahead and we're gonna dive right into it. We're gonna talk about the data. Um, so what we did is we collected individual advisor level data on financial planning from individual financial institutions, as well as from third party managers, uh, collectively representing over 700 banks and credit unions. So our data really uh, covers the full spectrum of firms from the very small single advisor shops to very large firms with hundreds of advisors. We have a full year's worth of planning data. So we have over 3,000 advisors represented and over 52,000 financial goal plans. Uh, the 44 data points for each of those 52,000 plans gives us the ability to, to get some insight into the depth of the planning as well as adoption of financial planning. So to uh, understand, I think the next step is to understand the metrics that we used. And so uh, to represent the planning adoption, or you might consider it also the breadth of planning, we were able to measure the number of households that an advisor engaged in planning. Now, this doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't uh, measure the completeness of the plan or whether the plan was presented or not, but it is a good representation of overall use of the planning tool. So, um, so not only are we able to uh, measure or, or get insight into the total number of households that were engaged in planning, but also the new households engaged in planning. This helps firms understand uh, if advisors are expanding their number of planning clients. So if a firm might have more newer advisors or even be newer in, the, in uh, adopting a financial planning process, you may see your advisors uh, engaging more new households than total households. Um, this year's financial planning data was, it should also be noted that uh, this was all goals-based financial planning versus cash flow. So um, that was really helpful for us when we wanted to take a look at the depth of financial planning because we know that an advisor will have a better understanding of a client's retirement spending when we when we separate the their retirement goals into very specific goals so versus just a one lump sum goal where it's all lumped together you, you just don't know that client as well so that's how we view that the goals being used are a good representation of the depth of planning and then the last metric that we uh, incorporated into planning insights was specifically the use of the healthcare goal. Uh, and anybody who knows me knows I'm pretty passionate about this, but it's because um, healthcare, first of all, is our clients, one of our clients' top concerns. It's also where a very large chunk of their retirement dollars are, are being spent. But if it also has a, has a higher inflation rate. And we know that if we don't incorporate the healthcare goal, we could be underestimating clients' retirement spending. So I'm going to just um, pause on that as far as the healthcare goal, because I think we're going to touch on that a little bit later as well. But um, those are basically the four metrics that we've incorporated into uh, Planning Insights. 
We, you're, in a moment, we're going to actually take a look at interpreting, interpreting some specific graphs and charts. But um, we, in Planning Insights, what we're trying to do is show a firm where the whole overall industry is and then where their specific firm is. And then lastly, we're going to be looking at the year over year results. But let's, let's get right to it uh, so we can get to the fun discussion here in a few minutes. Um, but this particular visualization is really focused around the adoption of financial planning. And um, it's showing us the households engaged in planning and the new households. The light gray bars represent the 3,000 plus financial advisors, the individual financial advisors, the overall industry. The bright blue bars are going to represent that, that specific firm. Uh, and this is a specific firm. So you're seeing this is just one of the, the sample reports. And we've got the set. So for example, in this particular case, 22%, which is this uh, first or the second bar, technically, right? 22% of the advisors at this particular firm engaged more than, more than zero, but less than one households on average per month. So the, the bottom axis is the number, uh, average number of households engaged. So this firm is actually a leading, this is a, this would be an example of a firm that's leading the industry because the industry for that same, uh, for that same level of planning, same level of household engagement is actually 51%. So this firm is at 22% of those advisors versus 51% of the overall industry. So without getting all tied up in the numbers, one really easy way to see this firm as being a leader is that as we are engaging more households to the right, the bars are getting taller, the blue bars are taller than the gray bars. So if you didn't even know what the numbers were, you could certainly see that this firm is doing better because they're engaging more households than the overall industry. Okay, is that, so in now that is actually similar uh, in the new households engaged. So this firm is, their bars are taller for more households than the gray bars. So this is, a, this is desirable. If you were a firm that had some of the firms that participated in our study, their bars were quite a bit taller on the less than one. So- hey, Did you see the question, Lee? I'm yeah, looking it's probably for you, okay. Did you yeah. see the question? Oh, you know what? No, I didn't see the question. Because I think you get the best answer. The question is how do you measure engagement? So we're measuring it by either a plan that was a financial goal plan that was either updated or created and we're only measuring like if a household was touched once during the year. It could be that that household was, that that advisor visited that household every single month, or it could be they once for the entire year. Mm -hmm. We're talking about engagement being a plan for a household that was either updated or created for that particular year. But, but that, okay. that, of course, is, is, is one of the things we're trying to get out of this meeting and subsequent conversations is yeah. how better to measure engagement. This is our first crack at, at that, looking at the, if you will, the raw fact that there was an engagement, but it certainly doesn't speak to the depth of the engagement, how often, how often the plan's updated and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Yeah. And as we, um, our goal also is gonna be to expand the study to, utilizing a number of different financial planning tools. So we know that our definition of an engagement is probably gonna to have to change over time. Great, thanks for pointing that out, Frank. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at the depth of planning and how did, we, how did we approach that this year? So this firm, again, this firm looks pretty good. So what we're doing here is we're measuring the depth of planning by the average of number of goals used. We kind of talked about that a moment ago. 
And so we took the total number of households. We looked at how many goals that that, that advisor used with that number, with those households. And we were able to get an average goal usage per households engaged in planning. So uh, to interpret this graph a little bit further for you, this firm has an at less than one on average, less than one plan per household, only 5% of the advisors are at that low goal usage. So versus the industry, the industry is actually at 18 or 20%. And they're at this really, we don't want that. We want advisors to actually be using more goals, right? So in fact, this is probably a good spot to interject that we happen to know that when a client creates a financial goal plan on their own, they use or they incorporate about seven to eight goals in their own goal plan. But when a financial advisor creates one for a client, we're still below three. We're like between two and three goals is what a financial advisor will use when he's creating a goal plan for a client. So we think that this is important for, for firms to see because we think there's an app opportunity to actually get to know our clients a little better through more specific goals and using more goals. So, um, so I would say a good target, um, there's four goals that are most commonly used and those are in our, uh, in the report, but it's the general retirement goal, the healthcare goal, the travel and the car or automobile. Those are the four most commonly used. So, you know, I would say the first target I would set would be for, you know, a target of four um, and then to work upwards from there. But then as we mentioned, um, we also are measuring the use of the healthcare goal. Now, what's, what's kind of interesting about this is that based on the firms I've, I've consulted for and worked with, it's not unusual for the clients to be about, uh, about 75% of the clients we're doing plans for are over the age of 50. So we wouldn't expect, we, and we know that clients over 50, we should be planning for healthcare for those folks because it's a big, it's a big, it's a lot of money going towards healthcare. So um, we would really want to see at least over 60% of ed, uh, advisors using the healthcare goal, the majority of your advisors should be using a healthcare goal over 60% of all plans. If you've got like 75% of your clients are over age 50. Ideally, you want those goals to align. But as you can see from this visualization, most advisors are using actually less than a healthcare goal less than 20% of the time for 20% of their clients. Let me see if I've actually got that number here. Um, yeah, 55% of all the advisors of the 3,000 financial advisors are using the healthcare goal less than half the time or less than 40%. So we know that there's some work. Most firms, I'm going to tell you the majority of firms I'm working with, they really, we need to help advisors get more comfortable uh, talking about that. So... Uh, Lee, we've uh, we've had another question come in coming coming over the uh, the chat, which I which I think kind of fits nicely. Um, so uh, this one's from from Corey Hacker. He says uh, we use Money Guide Pro and define a financial plan based on the conversation used by the financial professional. We believe a retirement and a retirement and estate conversation are considered financial plans. The other conversations are not pure financial plans. I, Corey seems to be. Uh, uh, referring to the healthcare conversation. Maybe you want to talk a little bit more about why you think having that conversation is, uh, you know, is, is, uh, is, is an important part of having a holistic plan. Um, so I'm thinking, I know I'm very familiar with Money Guide Pro, and I know what Corey's referring to because some of the a, a retirement conversation and the, what's the other, the retirement plus estate? 
Mm -hmm. Right. Those really are in Money Guide Pro. It touches on each area of the financial plan, all of the all the clients' assets, not only just their investments, but their home, their their insurance, their um, liabilities, and versus there are some intro level type plans, which are Money Guide Pro considers like a five minute plan, and those are do not those only look at a few pieces of the data. So I would agree with Corey completely um, in the fact that those particular conversations would be, uh, I would consider those to be true financial plans as well. So I really appreciate the, I appreciate the comment, Corey. Frank, do you want to, I mean, you yeah, guys. I was, we, I was, you alluded to this earlier, Lee, the way you've conducted the study. We, right now, if I, when I get to, if I get to our stats and talk about the number of plans we've done, it's just if you've started a plan, right? We don't really analyze the depth. We haven't broken it down into, okay, here's how many do deep plans, semi-deep plans, and shallow plans, which is why this is great. It really points to, because I, I know that we're at industry average, and um, we look at number of goals, like, wow, I've always worried, are we doing enough? And um, I would say, I think, you, I think this is what you were saying indirectly a few minutes ago, that the industry is probably not. The four goals you mentioned are pretty basic. I didn't hear anything about long-term care or anything like right. that. But the answer to the question is, you know, if you open up a GPM plan and put income assets and Social Security and healthcare plan, it's a plan. Um, even less than that sometimes. So, and our, you know, one of our incentives is just get it started, please. Get a plan started. At least get a plan started to someone start the view online. Yep. So, in fact, I actually wanted to um, bring Tony into the conversation for a second here, too, because not all financial plans have a healthcare goal. And if it, if the, not all financial planning software, not all financial planning tools have the ability to, or have a healthcare goal to add, to be able to measure or not. And, but if we don't have that specific healthcare goal built out, we could be, as I might've said before, underestimate a uh, client's retirement spending. And then advisors really don't know how to have that conversation. So I didn't know, Tony, if you had any thoughts about how advisors could be more confident in having a conversation around healthcare, especially if they don't have a specific goal to reference. Did you have yeah. anything? Lee, that's a fantastic question. So when we, um, we actually just signed a relationship with Ivante, which is a healthcare data aggregator. And that feeds into our engine and in fact, we have a module we built out uh, called the Guide Retirement Tool. Within that, um, our software will take your age and your income and with a great deal of accuracy, predict your retirement spending paradigm. And one of those three components or four components, uh, living, leisure, and healthcare, uh, taxes being the fourth. Um, so we do see that being the best and easiest way to deliver healthcare data to an individual is by using supporting information. So we're saying if, if you're 45 or 55 years old, you make this much money, we know with a great deal of accuracy that when you retire, these are kind of the four buckets of money you'll invest and they change over time. Uh, my favorite uh, analogy is the go-go, slow-go and no-go periods of retirement yeah, where yeah. you're spending a lot more in the living and leisure, you know, and you just, you know, you're, the Coco Cabana kind of thing. And then as you get over time, right, it, it kind of inverts to that healthcare. But so what we found to answer your question, mm -hmm. what we found is if the data is there, the advisor has a lot, is, is a much easier conversation. And the, the client then welcomes that because they say, okay, this is backed by data. This is what my peers are doing. This is what I need to do. So the more the data, the better. So Frank, did you have any, any, thoughts or comments on how your advisors might be approaching that? Oh, we have the healthcare goal that's built in the money guy. Yeah, pro. Right. It's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it's just, right. you just plug it in and it's safe. It's, it's actually really pretty accurate and we yeah. encourage everybody. That's just a, that's just a press of a button or two. You have to do it. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you for that. 
So then let's kind of keep moving along. Um, and the last thing that we're trying to help firms kind of get an idea is if they're trending in the right direction. So when you participate in planning insights for more than one year, we can actually show you your year over year results. So in this particular case, the, the gray bar is not the overall industry. Now the gray bar is last year's data or last year, yep, last year's data. And then the bright blue bar is gonna be the current year. So what you want here is you want most of these bar graphs to get taller to the right. So you want these, like for example, the, this four to six, engaging in four to six households per month, this is tremendous growth. This is, this particular firm went from, let me get my number here, um, well, it actually like less than 10, to 26, I think it was like 13 actually. Um, so they over doubled their percent of their advisors that are engaging four to six households per month in financial planning. And therefore you would assume that these bars that are further to the, these with less households get shorter, which they do because we're shifting some of those, the percent of, of advisors is growing with the higher number of households. So if we take the same idea and we look at the depth of planning or the goal usage, fewer advisors. So we went from nine to five, almost half the number of advisors were using just one plan or averaging less than one plan. And now more of them year over year are using one or two or two to three. So one to four plans, basically. So this is good. This is a, this is a firm that's trending in the right direction. And we can take and apply that same idea to the last graph as well. Shorter bars on the lower numbers, taller bars on the higher numbers. So we do see some indication that this firm is heading in the right direction on the use of healthcare, uh, that healthcare goal, probably not where we want it to be, but he heading in the right direction. So that's, a, that's good news. So keep, yes, Frank, go ahead. I was, keep going, keep going. There's a, there's a pricing question that I'm like chomping at the bit to get to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Um, lastly, I just wanted to, I'm just gonna spend about two seconds on this. All I wanna do is I wanted to leave you all attendees, uh, and as well as folks that are gonna listen to this recording later, I wanted to give you, this is the year over the year industry view. So this is the whole industry, 3000 financial advisors, 2018 versus 2019. So again, some progress, not a lot, but question is, you know, now you're able, if you are a firm that participated, you can kind of see where you fall. And then the question would be, are others interested in understanding where they fall? So now I really want to get to some of the, the great discussion that we want to have. Frank, did you want to jump in with your question? Oh, wait, wait, you're right. It was a question that was posed. And I think yeah. I'd like to hear what everybody has to say about that, actually, because it's okay. really, I think we're at a, uh, a point in the industry where it's beginning to change. So the question was, do you charge for plans? Mm. And um, I mean, I think it's safe to say most advisors have charged for plans, although they were calling it free. I'll manage your money for 1%, for example, and I'll give you a free plan. Now that whole plan is, that whole method is upside down now. Um, the value is in the plan now. So how do you go back and reverse that conversation? Um, but I, I mean, and not just at Raymond James, I think the majority of the industry from all the studies I've seen, so really included, is still a percentage of asset center management, uh, which includes plan, which I think over time is we need to think about because it's just not apples and oranges. We are, we, we have started and begun a, a, a process and a form to charge a flat fee. Uh, so it's definitely not the majority at our firm, but uh, we're heading that way more and more. And I think it's a good point um, for those clients just starting out with, with lesser AUM, it's definitely the way to go. Um, 
because sometimes percentage of assets in our management with no assets is obviously nothing. So, but there's still value in a plan. So I'd like to see what others have to say as well. So Ken and Tim, I know we just did some um, on our last presentation or our last virtual meeting. I think we talked a little bit about this and about what, how many firms actually charge for a plan. Did you want to just quickly add a comment or two on that? Yeah. So um, uh, Lee is referring to a, um, a separate study um, covered uh, 87 banks and credit unions that offer financial planning, and you know two, two thirds of those never charge for the plan under any circumstances. Uh, the remaining third, you know, may um, uh, may, may charge uh, sort of on a sliding scale based on uh, how many meetings per year the advisor does with the client, uh, how often the plan gets updated. Um, some firms offer a free or um, a, a sort of low cost uh, planning option that's usually self-directed and not as, and not as detailed, but certainly as, um, as a channel, financial institutions and their advisors do not charge for plans. And we hear um, anecdotally that um, uh, there's concern, right, that, that clients will be turned off if they're asked to pay, um, and that maybe the advisors aren't gonna be comfortable justifying the fee or um, explaining the fee structure. Um, you know, one other quick point I'll make is that our, uh, our, our research um, into those clients that have plans tell us that um, of all of your clients, the ones with plans and the ones that want them are the ones that are most likely to be willing to pay. So uh, from the client perspective, the fee doesn't, um, uh, doesn't appear to be a barrier. Thank you, Tim. Um, and I think just for our sake of needing to move along, um, I, I think it's an important question. Um, I would also encourage folks, we have recorded that previous session where we spent, we took a really deep dive into the, you know, whether or not you should charge for a plan. So I'd encourage you to maybe go review that video or, or that recording, because that might be, uh, provide you some additional insight. So what I wanted to do before we kind of left uh, planning insights a little bit is to let you all know that we're trying to determine how we can make this more useful in the future. So I didn't know if uh, we could get anybody's, you know, any feedback on maybe things that you found sp particularly useful or things that we might be missing. Did it, and I know that this is also going to be shared with folks that are going to listen to the recording for some folks that could not attend. So, um, you know, we'll be looking for feedback over time, but anybody off the top of their head have anything that they wanted to add on this? I think number of goals Please. used is really helpful. Um, now, you, from a business standpoint, if you look at the everybody else is kind of in the same area, right? Doing three to four goals per plan. But I just think that just tells me, Lee, you and I talked about it. Um, this is not a derogatory remark, but most advisors do not really realize the depth of planning they can do with most softwares. It just, and we're really focused on that now. Like we've held sessions on lend versus spend and uh, long-term care goals, which, for everybody on this phone, that's probably pretty simple stuff, but um, uh, it's just not used enough. And um, it just tells us we really, really need to drill down and, and do specialized training on just, just break down one specialized component per month, for example, as opposed to trying to educate everybody in an hour about how to do a full financial plan that doesn't work, but that's really useful. You know, I was having a conversation with an advisor, and this is a firm that's maybe used Money Guide Pro for um, a good number. I mean, not uh, maybe four or five years now, and the advisor didn't know how to give their client access to their plan online or the client portal. So I'm interested in knowing if you all would find that interesting would you guys like to see some insight in the number uh, or the percent of, percent of households that have been given 
like client portal access. Client portal yeah, access for plans absolutely. in general too. Like how of, of households engaged, what is the what is the population of households that could be engaged? That that's I'd love to know that. Um, now when you say new households engaged, you're not you're not talking about new clients, you're talking about a household that gets a plan for the first time, right? Yeah, I'm saying it could be yeah. a prospect or a client. Yeah, okay. All right. But um, I would love more information on, okay, of, of, what, of the population that you can plan for, what is the percentage that have a plan? I think that would be really interesting. So kind of like penetration. Yeah, yeah. Of we look books? at it two ways. We look at it from a client standpoint and an asset standpoint. Um, and um, they're really different. Well, that, that sort of begs the question of who should have a plan, right? Uh, some people argue that everyone should have a plan. Right. Right. And others would say, well, I only want a plan for people who are profitable for me. Yes. Which would mean uh, they would have $200,000 of assets or one fifty dollars or a million. What's your threshold? Firms have different thresholds that they like to impose. So uh, that's so it's kind of hard. Well, it's a great. It's a great point, Ken. And we look. We look at it overall, like for every client from A to Z, and then we go to target market as well. That's desirable. I mean, we look at those percentages as well. But I'd love to know what's happening at other firms, Lee, that you work with, other banks, and institutions to see how we all stack up. I mean, I, at the end of the day, you want to know if you think you're doing great, but maybe you're not. Maybe you're not doing so great. You need to pick it up. Well, well, typically, if if you take took a a traditional um, mass affluent bottom threshold and say everyone above that and, uh, and above the age of 45 or so should have a plan. Then you're looking at for the typical bank, 21% of their customer base. Yeah. Fit that, you know, let's call it a, inter, inter, you know, the kind of person you'd want to have as a client in, mo in most institutions. Mm -hmm. And that'll vary by, by bank and it'll vary by what the firm's thresholds and targets are but uh, so in, in the kind of things that we usually look at we look at all the banks households and say what kind of penetration are you getting there but you can refine that to look at uh, let's call it the qualified investor or the qualified client or what, what, mm -hmm. whatever you want to describe that as being the, the denominator you want to use in your hands. yes okay. agreed so Noreen what is the what do you um, what do you encourage or coach, like who, who should have a financial plan at Huntington? Well, you know, um, I, I was uh, thinking about jumping in several times in this last conversation. You know, we do, we do a few things. One, one thing we strongly encourage is um, to use a financial plan to justify um, the position, positioning of a product with a client with our principal review desk, right? So um, we, we've had a lot of uh, conversations and, and some issues, right, in, in moving advisors into um, a more holistic approach. So one of the things I was thinking, and this isn't exactly an answer to your question, Lee, but I'll get back to that if I may, is um, harder to measure you know, when you're just looking, not, not just, but when you're looking at planning statistics, but as we, as we take our advisors and get them to start, you know, broadening the way they think, the way they approach relationships, you know, that holistic word that we, we use so, so regularly, it, it's a, um, an indication of how successful they are being in using multiple goals and in actually engaging the whole household is how many different products do you, are you, are you positioning with a client? So have you effectively, you know, we're great at annuities. Yep. And that's important. You know, lots of people need a regular income, right? But have you then also looked at their, um, their uh, goals for future generation legacy needs, right? So have you positioned a managed account? Um, have you used the Hold on, Noreen. Your volume cut out. Sorry, my mute we went on all by itself. <laughs> Sorry. So, so I don't know where, how far to go back now. I apologize. <laughs> no, it just it just cut out just a moment ago. Oh, okay. Talking about okay, looking great. into the future for estate planning. Yeah. For Right, right. So, so, so looking at it, you know, insurance products, and again, it's not so much like the actual sales, but more 
how are you using the planning to develop the relationship? And so like how many, it's, it's, it's a kind of another take on how many goals have you, have you explored in that? How many solutions have you found for the client? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and back to your original question, which I think was, you know, where do we give guidance on, uh, we don't we don't have a line like that uh, again because it's because we're trying to get the advisors to stop thinking about selling a thing to a client and instead deepening relationships through doing planning. Mm-hmm. So, hey Lee, it's mm-hmm. Peter. Just to maybe build on what what Noreen said, the um, we also have to think of it in the context of our bank or credit union in that we work with advisors a lot and try to get them to do more plans, but we need our, our bank, our parent bank, to understand what it's going to take for the advisors and for the business to do more plans, meaning it has to be resourced right. We can push on advisors all day long, but if it's not resourced right with the right people, the right tools, the right experience, the right focus, the right compensation plan, the right tracking, if it doesn't have all of that, we can push on advisors all day long and we're not gonna do more plans. So part of this is the bank has to understand that with the shift to planning, in many ways it's similar to the shift that we performed some years ago with the shift to advisory. It takes some investment on the front end, it pays you off in the long run. We're doing the exact same thing today or we need to do the exact same thing today that many firms did three, four, five, six years ago. But, but I think that's a big focus too, is we've got to look up the food chain and not just at the advisors to get after what. And then you decide, okay, how, how many plans, you know, what client base do we want to have planning for? Is it our, you know, is it the top 5%? Well, you're going to resource that different than if it's the top 35%. And then at least you've all agreed on what you're trying to accomplish versus Everyone just out there saying, well, let's do more plans. Let's do more plans. That's so, a great Paul, point. I think, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, it's a great point. I'll go ahead. Go. Okay, Paul, this I think is a great segue into because you've made tremendous progress. And so please share some of, you know, and in particular, how you got the bank to buy in. Right? Oh, wait, you're on mute. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. You know, Peter just said the, the thing that's the most important, which is uh, having the bank buy in. And I've always been of the belief that the, the, um, the trump card and everything is client experience. So we've been real big on preaching more of a financial planning process with every client versus a financial plan because uh, there's any number of reasons related to resources. Um, but the process is what is important. Now, if I can just tell a quick story, I think it, it kind of speaks a little bit to our philosophy. Um, back when we bought, my wife and I bought our first house, we were living in North Carolina and we were looking to sell our house. And one of the things we needed to do was fix it up and touch it up. And uh, we saw a seminar that a local painter was putting on on how to sell or how to paint your, your home. So we're like, hey, this will be a great way for us to save some money. So we went to the seminar, sure enough, we watched this guy explain how to use tools, what tools to use, what techniques, how to get around the corners. And then uh, long story short, at the end of the seminar, um, we did what everybody else did, which was we said, you know what, this guy can do it so much better than us, we're just gonna hire him. And he walked away with a lot of business. Uh, I share that story because throughout my career as an advisor, that was really my plan. I would go into the, the branches and I would say, you know what, I'm going to teach your customers how to do their own financial plan. Because I figured if it worked well for this painter, it'll work really well for us. And we would have um, small workshops and, and conference rooms, no more than five to 10 people. And sure enough, by the end, they're telling each other, boy, you know what, we learned a lot of good stuff today, but I'm going to, I'm going to hire that guy. <laughs> and that's how I built my practice. So I try to apply that same logic to working with the bank. And instead of, you know, customers, I, I say, you know, who, who's are my real client here? And it's, it's the bankers. And how do we deliver a customer experience that the bank can really rally behind and, and get, get behind it? Um, 
I have to say, in every organization, you really need a champion who's going to be committed to this. And in my organization, thanks to the fact that my time has been freed up considerably because we use a third-party uh, broker-dealer, that's my, my commercial for that, um, I, I pretty much go out and I wholesale financial planning every opportunity that I get. And what does that mean? That means being very um, proactive every month, I'm meeting with all the branch managers in their regional meeting. Every month, I'm meeting with the commercial team. I'm meeting with the private bankers. And we're delivering a message that they can understand. Um, Lee, is it okay if I share my screen? Because I just want to show a little bit of what, what's involved. Because we've got tremendous. Um, Go for it. This is going to be exploring new areas, having a panelist share right. their screen. I'm going to need you to, I do, I'm going to need you to just stop sharing your screen and then, and then allow me to share mine. Got it. All right. Let's see here. Because what I want to show is, you know, this isn't something where I just show up to a meeting and, and uh, I'm, I'm somewhat prepared. I want to show up to the meeting and be fully prepared. So I developed this, this uh, playbook that I use. And to be quite frank, it's uh, almost 100 pages. But every month I'm doing some sort of activity with these bankers where I'm personalizing it. So for instance, I've got, um, if you're familiar with the show, uh, Whose Line Is It Anyways? I've got a presentation where I sit down with the bankers and I say, okay, here we have a client who just sold his business, deposited $500,000 in the bank, and here's some basic facts about them. Now, is this client in good shape or bad shape? And everybody's like, oh, great shape, $500,000, that's a lot of money, right? I mean, think about your, your um, average retail banker. And then we go through and it's like, well, here's some of the questions that we ask is how much money do you want to spend in retirement? How much have you currently have saved? Because it surprises a lot of people that this particular client, and this was a real case, didn't have a lot of money saved in their, um, saved in their, in their retirement plan. So they were relying a lot on this, this $500,000. And long story short, we got to the end of the exercise and they quickly realized, oh my goodness, this person's not in good shape. They're in big trouble. They're in danger of running out of money. So then you engage them by saying, well, what can you offer? What are their options to be in much better shape? Great, we went through the exercise. They can work longer, they can spend less, they can tighten the belt, put more money in or take more risk. All right, let's, let's make up somebody just off the cuff. And we go through and we'd use the financial planning software to like, tell me a profession. Somebody shout out an age of a client. Shout out, somebody shout out how much they have saved. And we would go through and we would do this and I would have somebody with their watch the whole time timing it. And by the end of the presentation, we would have figured out, you know, that this person is now in good shape. And I would say, all right, it took us less than 15 minutes to change somebody's life. Now think about what that means to your clients. How many of you right now are really motivated? So that's, you know, one, one monthly example. In front of the uh, commercial team, I'll share just another one. Um, you know, I always like to stand up in front of them because they're, they're a tough nut to crack, right? Like it, often they're thinking singular focus, don't want to mess with the client relationship. But I always say, what's the worst thing that can happen to your client? And I'll sit back and I'll just start writing down all the things. Maybe they can't sell their business when they want to, or they can't sell it at all. Maybe uh, the son or daughter they are planning on being their retirement plan just really isn't fit for it. Um, their product or service becomes obsolete. They get sued. There's new competition. Health. I mean, you mentioned an important one. Disability, death. I mean, we'll, we'll list them all. And then it's like, well, now let's look at our financial planning process because our process is very, very simple. There's only four parts to it. First part is discovery. The second part is the design. So we'll go through and all of the possible things that we can do in a financial plan, we're going through and saying, how many of these apply to cover all of these things that could happen to your client? Now, all of a sudden, the commercial team's going, whoa, wait a second. This is good stuff. You guys haven't really talked about investments or investment products. That's what, that's what used to happen in the past. This feels different. This feels like we're legitimately helping people. And I think that's what's really, really, really important. Our advisors have the tools to take them through this four-part financial planning process with everyone, but we automate the low side and we customize, customize the, the high side. I mean, Frank being on board, you know, when I came on board here, my first question was, well, what if we have a client who has $10 million? 
how do we how do we deal with it? And it's like everybody's giving me cases and scenarios of somebody who doesn't have ten million dollars. Less than that. It's like, you know what? We've got a resource here with with Raymond James that can give us what we need for over ten million dollars. So now all of a sudden you look at our pipeline list and I'm going, oh my goodness, I've never seen a pipeline so robust with the the opportunities that we're getting because we're confidently standing in front of the entire bank and we're doing this. All right. So why do I why do I mention all this? I'm gonna share one more thing. You know, financial planning makes a big difference. I love this because um, really, you just look at the stats and you're like, how can you go wrong with with doing all these things? Like you win their their mind, but how do you win their heart? Well, you have some fun with it. You personalize it. I'm gonna show some pictures of me wearing a championship belt just to prove two points. Point number one, when you wear a championship belt, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you're gonna look really cool doing it. <laughs> Point number two, have fun with it with the banker. So you gotta find that, that person. You have to find who those champions are in your bank. You have to promote those people. The last firm I went to, we had a two women team who said, you know what, Paul, I looked at the statistics. We're gonna gamble. We're gonna bet our entire careers on financial planning. We're going to do financial planning process with everyone. This is somebody who went from $300,000 a year to $800,000 in a single year just by adopting financial planning. That captures everyone else's attention. Those who, who did financial planning, I know this year, it's like the top 10 leaderboard has completely flipped. And there's a new top 10. And that old top 10, they don't like not being the top 10 anymore. So now they're looking at financial planning. As I go out and I talk about the bank, we don't talk about investment products. We talk about how to personalize financial planning for, for their clients. It's got the attention of the president of our bank. It's got the attention of the head of retail. I mean, think about this for a second. This is, we're about a year and a half into this process. I have the head of retail now telling me in January, Paul, I want to do a class every single month in front of everyone now that we have Zoom, where you teach them how to do more financial planning because this is working. You're teaching them how to be better bankers, how to gather more deposits, how to do more loans. And oh, by the way, in the process of doing that, we're getting a lot of investment referrals out of it. So thank you for letting me participate. I know, you know I'm not as much on the academic side as I am more on the sales side of this, but I know going to a lot of these things, everybody sees the data and everybody gets fired up. Hopefully I can provide some you know, insight into what my playbook is and one that's worked really well in terms of um, adopting financial planning across the entire bank organization, not just our team. No, Paul, thanks so much for sharing that because you you touched on a number of points that I wanted to make sure came out, right? And one of the things that you just mentioned that I want to segue into just for a second is, and you and I have talked about this, you say, well, not everybody should have a financial plan. And you said, well, you know, for the bottom tier, how did you put that? You Yeah, the, the lower tier the lower tier clients, right? So for what us, is, it's under $100,000. Um, okay. We, in, in today's world, we can automate a lot of that, but it doesn't mean we can't take them through the process. And the process can start with the banker and their discovery. It's, it's real important. Sorry, so, I feel like I, I just cut you off in a very important point you're going to make. No, 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 that was perfect because I wanted to actually get Tony, Tony, like normally that client that, that Paul is talking about that's the younger client, right? They don't have, haven't had time to, to, you know, amass over a hundred thousand dollars, but I was just kind of wondering, I think you might have some insight as to how do we get more engagement with younger clients, right? If we want to truly get an adoption of a planning process, right? Well, that's great. So um, and I, I want to focus on Noreen's comments from before as well, because I, and I think everyone can agree that measuring goals and how that relates to financial planning, that, I think that's a fair <laughs> metric, right? To say you have a certain amount of goals, the plan's a little more complete, but I think Noreen's onto something and what we're actually developing is very similar to that. Uh, we've identified kind of nine key essential points to a plan and those might not, they're not necessarily goal related. Um, it's understanding fully the client and kind of it's capturing understanding the accounts um, not necessarily share a wallet, not necessarily capturing share a wallet, but understanding the wallet makeup, but then also kind of getting through that whole process of those nine essential points. So to your point on kind of targeting that 
that, that demographic with lower investable assets, they too want to talk about planning for, for instance, an estate or saving for their kid's college. They still want to have those conversations. It's a matter of whether or not they have the assets or they're ready to actually start investing or taking part in that plan. So I guess another way to, to say it is that don't treat those younger investors uh, with baby talk. Don't talk to them like they're a baby, right? Give them all of those essentials, explain what that is. Maybe do peer comparison using technology to say, this is what your peer group is doing. But we think that's a better way to A, measure a plan and the value of a plan, but B, also entice those individuals because they're exposed to uh, robos, self-directed solutions all day long. Those robos ask the same questions. They ask the same risk tolerance questions. They say, do you wanna retire one day? But the advisor, the value of that human is saying, hey, we need to talk about these other things too because they're just as important and it's better to start now. So don't talk to them like a baby. Use technology to help kind of answer those questions for them. And I think it's a much more valuable financial plan. And I think Noreen, based, yeah. on the, based on your example, I think that's exactly what you're trying to do too is really understand that full client profile and then slowly chip away at that. Even if it's not a goal, even if it's not established yet, it's saying, We've set that baseline. We understand, we see that you have insurance or whatever that case is. And that's part of those nine essentials to a financial plan. Well, I'm so. interested in learning more about those nine essentials because I, I like where the conversation's going and I can see where we may need to, you know, like let's take all this away and then figure out how we make planning insights more useful based on, you know, kind of what we're all learning. So that's- yeah, well, glad, well, I'll gladly share it with the whole group, yeah. Excellent. That's great. That's a great point. I because my babies are twenty seven years old, and they they will remember you if you talk to them like a baby. They will remember that. I mean, they're future clients as well. And right, there's a way to provide them a valuable plan that really doesn't take a lot of time with all the softwares today. I think you know that. Um, there's been a movement towards planning light, just for that reason. Yeah, I mean, they, they can they can do that already. They know that. They're you know, I used to absolutely. I used to, I used to work in banking, and I try to equate a story. Um, you know, we, we, were, we were working on mortgages and trying to grow the origination business in the branches. And at the time, Quicken Loans and these other larger electronic uh, originators were kind of coming to the market. And we did a bunch of studies on it and, um, because we were concerned. What we found, though, is if uh, when someone walks in the door to a branch uh, to seek out a mortgage, they've done six to eight hours of research online already. And if the mortgage broker talks to them like a child, or doesn't know the answer to something, that individual is very turned off and they're ready to go. They'll go somewhere else. That's just how they are. So the same holds true for planning mm -hmm. because they're doing their research. They know they have to save. They know there's healthcare ramifications. They've been exposed to the robos already. So it's how do you, how do you talk to them? Like, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's a bad analogy talking like a baby, but how do, you, how do you not trivialize that very important conversation? They wouldn't be engaging with you if they didn't feel it was important. They wouldn't want to be sold and then the state thought it was important. So it's really approaching it differently. Well, well the, other, the other point there is these are the recipients of the transition of wealth. And if they feel like they're not being given adult treatment, for lack of a better word, it's only that came to my mind, they could go to their parents, right? Or their grandparents and say, no, no, don't, don't work with them. They're, they're, you know, right. So it's all about the, the entire family relationship and and positioning yourself better for the transition of wealth, which is still the elephant in the room that we really need to address all of us. So, you know, just, it's important. It's a good yeah. point. So Frank, since um, we were, I, I, I think one of the things I wanted to make sure that you had a chance to share was a little bit about, you know, what are the, the biggest and best advisors at Raymond James doing? Are they, they doing planning and, how do you get them? How do you get these top guys to do this, right? Um, it's really, you know, what I said, the question is not how to get the top advisors to do it. It's how to get the movable middle to do it. Um, I'm going to share my screen for a second, um, if I may. So this is a graphic of, this is across all of Raymond James, right? So I'm responsible for wealth planning, which means, um, our, our employee advisor division of Raymond James and Associates, our independent division, Raymond James Financial Services, and our financial institutions division, headed up by Tim Kilgore. And he's on this call as well. I told him to text me if I get out of line. I'm so far so good. But um, you can see here, like, we, we have 
heavy, heavy users are 60 plans or more cumulatively and far away. I mean, they have the most assets and they have the most as a result revenue. When you look at moderate 20 to 59, I did some envelope math. It's, you know, 49% less in, uh, in AUM and 66% less in revenue. So, um, and I've been at Raymond, Raymond James since we rolled out uh, Money Guy Pro. And well, you can't say it's because of planning, Frank. You can only say it's correlated. I'm saying, okay, well, that's fine. I think now we can say that, but the message is, even if it is correlated, if you want to emulate what the best advisors are doing, they're doing the planning, and that's why they're the best advisors. You know, we have a whole suite of longevity resources. That's not what this is about, but they flock to that too. So, um, and that's part of the training. It's, uh, we don't do anything at all to incentive advisors to plan. There's no bonus or, you know, campaigns or anything like that. Really the incentive is to, be a better advisor, number one, do the right thing and increase your business. If you look at all of our, we've done um, 357,000 plans since fiscal year 13. And um, the average assets per plan is 1.14 million. And what's interesting about that is 44% of those assets on average are from outside. And the heaviest users on average have identified about 60 to 70 million of outside assets. So that's the incentive. The incentive is if you really want to improve your business and become, have your business be more significant, it's, it's through planning. Does that, does that make sense? I think it sounds like you're yeah, so right it's, on track. So right, right, right in the middle of what we're trying to, you know, get, get to do more. It's pretty evenly, you can see the numbers below. It's 2000, 2000, 2000, and um, the 4367, I, don't, I, I think that includes a lot of, um, uh, registered assistants and whatnot, because we only have 8,000 advisors, so it's a little inflated, but um, we're just trying to get more and more. Because um, if you look at, and we can talk earlier, if you look at percentage of clients at Raymond James that have a plan, it's about 25, 30%. Percentage of assets is higher. I like that measure better because you want to make sure you're focused on that right pocket of assets. But still, even though we think we've done a good job, and I'm uh, uh, that's what our providers tell us. I mean, we have a long way to go. So that's why I say the movable middle. There's so many more people that need to have a plan. I'm a fan I, of that. I'm a fan. So tell me, you when did you develop this visual? And when did you start like getting this message out? Because I think part of the way you're going to get adoption is by giving you know, by spreading the message and they have to have, they have to be able to see these numbers, right? Yeah, they do. And um, the, as you know, data in our business is tough to get, and we just started getting this data over the last two to three years. And um, you can kind of see the results of it. You know, these are, these are the number of plans created per year, and it's really increased. Um, interesting, this year, and this goes to, for I think everybody knows, the value of planning has really increased this year, right? So if you look at plans per month, this year overall, I mean, it really dipped. I was like, oh man, it's gonna be bad, bad year for planning. And then it came roaring back, right? To the point where we did one less plan. I mean, one less plan than we did last year. And that was a record year. Um, but I all, what I think is really also important is, I don't know if you can see this, but number of plans modified went from 150,000 to 207,000. And we, we have a fiscal year that just ended September 30th. So it's up to date through then. So, um, so I think I answered your question. The more we share this data, the more increase in planning that we're seeing. But I think planning is becoming more popular in general. It's where the value is today. Um, and um, it's becoming more, um, you know, it's, it's out there more. But I think we, we, the other thing we say is if your client does not have a plan, that client is at risk, even if it's a very simple plan. If the question is asked, Lee, do you have a plan with your financial advisor? And you say no, and I offer you one and tell you, all that, that it can do and show you interactively on screen, there's a good chance that you may uh, become a client of mine, I think. Right. So I think you were also alluding, and, and I'm not trying to, um, I want to get to some other folks to add some yeah. stuff, but uh, you were also telling me we're, we're going to call this the COVID effect? Yeah, the COVID effect. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, for this end, and I think someone mentioned this earlier, I think it was Noreen. Um, 
it's not just about, well, it does help product, right? Like if you're talking about annuity or long-term care, one of the challenges I think traditional FAs have had is talking about it. You can display it. It just makes it so much better, but it also um, helps you to plan for longevity related issues like critical care and long-term care. And um, we've seen clients across the board looking to their advisor and their financial advisor for more help with, I'll say caregiving. I think everybody on this call, I, I'll bet has been exposed to some form of caregiving. And that's the COVID effect. They're all of a sudden, it's really, really important. Well, and I thought what I really liked about what you said too, when we were talking over the phone is that you saw planning kind of take a dip, but you use that time. Exactly, to, you're talking about here. Yeah, exactly. You, you actually, you were saying, you know, our advisors just don't even know what a plan can do. We use that for additional training and coaching, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we have, um, we have three different teams. We have a, we call, we call money guy pro goal planning and monitoring. Uh, we have a team that just takes calls all day. That's all they do. We have a financial plan of team of 10, all CFPs that understand the software well. And then we have a team of seven wealth consultants that understand the software. So no matter who you turn to and wealth planning, it's required that they know the software inside and out. And to your point, we're doing more specialized webinars about what's important today, protecting your assets, uh, planning, having, having at least a contingency for long-term care. Um, and not only how will you cover it, but what resource will you use? What are some of the resources you can use? That's a whole separate call and conversation, but that's something that really helps the planning process as well. So I wanna segue over to Doug on this because um, we're talking about kind of that top down, bottom up approach, you know, as far as like, okay, you've got the message coming from the top and then what kind of resources, Frank, you just talked about the resources that Raymond James has. But I think one of the things is that there are, uh, there's a missed opportunity. There's a lot of firms that don't have somebody that it can be that bottom up for some of these firms. And, and um, it's just such a critical resource. So I wanted to have Doug, you know, you're, you absolutely, well, why don't you tell folks what you do and um, what your role is and a little bit about what you do to support BMO. Yeah, so uh, as you know, um, great job at a great institution, uh, following in your footsteps. Um, really a great place to work uh, with the planning agenda because it's really in the fiber of what we do. It's at the core of the value proposition um, across lines of businesses too. Like it's, you hear it in, you know, from the top down, leadership is really focused on it. Um, really empowered by our head of sales, Pete, Pete Schmidt. Um, Really, so my personal focus is better quality plans and more efficiency in the planning process, um, which kind of in response to some of this discussion um, is a balance of complexity where, you know, there are smart defaults in Money Guide Pro allow you to, to build a decent plan pretty quickly. Um, so that's, you know, who gets a plan really is at the hands of the advisor. We don't um, we don't dictate that, but it's really just a, a challenge for them to manage the complexity. Um, I always encourage them to to keep things simple and get it in front of the client, bring the client into the conversation where you're refining and, and eventually adding complexity, building additional goals, um, helping the client visualize their future in the plan. Once you've done that, you really own the relationship. Um, yeah, so... I have some additional comments on the, the next generation thing too, but. Yeah, so Doug, share a little bit about what you're doing to, you know, with the regional managers. So. Yeah, yeah, so I mentioned being empowered. Um, relatively recently, um, started making the rounds um, from when we moved to the remote format, um, doing two-on-one meetings with. Want, yes. sure, yeah, the. Uh, yeah. With, Yep, the regional managers and um, individually meeting with their advisors, um, which has has been, first of all, really great. Um, great for um, educating, having a, an individualized conversation, um, and also creating some, some really strong accountability as far as um, whatever that advisor needs or whatever that regional manager's agenda is, whether it's 
um, you know, a specific area of Money Guide Pro or um, a specific product conversation. Um, so that's been really great. Also, it's given me a chance to implement um, a series of dashboards that I put together um, in Power BI using stats from um, Money Guide Pro, um, both firm level, regional level, and individual. So um, it's been great, like, actually using these to help focus these conversations and create accountability. So that's been really impactful, already seeing an uptick on the stuff we've been focusing on. Um, yeah. No, thanks, Doug. And you know, I, since I had conversations with each one of you, um, and as you know, I'm always trying to put a lot of, a lot of information in a little bit of time, right? Um, but so I just wanted to also uh, point out too that I think Doug's role is so beneficial because he can really help uh, advisors in that full utilization of the tool. And I think Frank, your team does the same thing. So I just wanted to stress that point. But um, I want to go back just for a second. And um, Noreen, we were talking a little bit about the COVID, you know, and what's been going on. And, and I want to spend just a few minutes on that. And then um, just like what has planning been recently um, and specifically what I'm looking for, I loved that comment from that regional manager. <laughs> so, but whatever uh, else that you wanted to share today, as far as the best um, practice. Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, you. You know, I'm looking at the, the questions in the chat and there have been um, a lot of really good questions. Uh, some of the things that, um, that we've done to incent planning is to align the align the goals right so we have uh we have two planning consultants in the well i have still not stopped saying in the field nobody's allowed to be in the field but they're supposed to be so they're on the phone right with our advisors and they um but full time and and so the, and they're on a comp plan and their comp plan is tied to the regional sales managers so that um, because every advisor has a number of goal, uh, sorry, a number of plans they're supposed to do per quarter. Um, the field consultants are, their comp plan assures that advisors, or, or that it's tied to how many advisors meet those goals, right? But then because they, we want, we want them to be. Oops, wait, wait, wait. You went on mute. There you go. Nope, you're still on mute. <laughs> there you are. I okay. Think. There we go. There I am. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Nope. Um, so the uh, so we tie the field consultants comp plan to the regional sales manager comp plan so that we know they're working together, right? So that's one thing that we've done to you know kind of start to finish to keep everybody aligned. Uh, another thing that um, that we did was tie for the you know for the very senior advisors. We talked a little bit. I think it was um, Frank and Paul. Maybe both were saying about getting your senior advisors engaged in planning, and and that can be challenging because they've been so successful, right? Like, why why change what works? It, it, it's it's working well. So. Um, so we, we put in a plan for them to get restricted stock units and tie, which obviously only the most senior advisors would get, and then we tied one of the KPIs to plans. Um, and um, it, it took them, a, it, it only took one year for them to realize that that was a real thing, and now they have to get engaged in planning. And so, so, so I think we all know in this business, you know, advisors are more likely to do what you incent them to do, and so, so just pulling it all together, um, we, we thought made sense and, and, has, and has been very effective. Um, to the COVID effect that we were talking about before, it's been, um, you know, we, we've, we've been encouraged, you know, talk to your clients, be calling your clients, the same thing every firm is saying, but, you know, they're all home with their records now. So they can't dodge you. They can't say, I don't have it, you know, because that's where they are. They're home where all their, all their data is, right? So encouraging advisors to... to You're seeing that really be effective. <laughs> um, and and uh, the comment you made, Lee, uh, when, we, when we spoke, uh, whenever it was, a couple of days ago, was, um, you know, 
this whole working from home thing and not being in the branches, um, at least at, at the start, was really startling, um, obviously, for a lot of people. And one of our regional sales managers, uh, we, were, we were just talking about the coaching that needs to be done and encouraging advisors to get out there and whatever they could to do the work. We had one of our regional sales managers say um, that it's the, this environment and what's happened in COVID, COVID has really shown those who were meant to be in this business, the, mm -hmm. the people on our team, people on our teams who are meant to be financial advisors because they've evolved and they've done what it takes to to meet with the clients to bring them along to take them from the fear and and put a plan together and it's been um in some cases you know actually inspiring it really has i was i just thought that was a great i wanted to make sure that comment came out so so much thanks so much for that Thank but i i I know we're kind of running out of time here and I want to get over to Tony because Tony, I think you had a few good things that a few nuggets that you'd love to share. And one of the things was, I think some of the data you have about COVID, right? You know, it's funny. I, uh, when Frank mentioned the COVID data, I was pulling up statistically what we, so for those that aren't aware, Navaplan has 140,000 users on the, uh, the system in North America. And so we kind of watched and trend. So from a trend, January and February are the same. So trending volume, planning volume, there's two types of, we, well, we track a variety of planning volume, but we, new client creation, and of course, revision, plan revision. And because we generate five or six million plans a year, we have some pretty sophisticated and accurate data. So February, January are the same in 2020. And then, you know, <laughs> you know uh, COVID hit and the world turned upside down. And what we, so, so we started watching and tracking that data and what was really fascinating was that our data completely went uh, inversed. And 30, so the data, the data is this, 34% of plans, there was an increase. Did I lose you? Are we still? No, you're there. Oh, okay. We're here. Okay. Yeah. 34% of plan increase in updates and revisions in that first six months of the year. So there is the significant 30% uptick in plan revisions mm -hmm. and almost a flat line in new plan creations. But then in June, so a few months after this hit, um, one in one data, in one month, there's a 64% increase in plans updated in June against the year prior. So what we, that, you know, that really excited us and it's excited everyone here is yeah. that all of these clients went to their advisor immediately. And that's the first thing you want them to do, right? They want to make sure everyone's healthy. The second thing is should be going to the advisor because they don't want this to happen again. And it really, it put all of our heads down. We said, we're going to revise planning. We're going to revise your plan. You're okay. Don't worry. We got this. And what we saw then from the new client creation was through February, we saw an increase in new client creation of 6% year over year. So we said to ourselves, okay, the economy is doing great. We saw we're adding more clients and 6% significant when you really think about it. Um, and then in June, so when we look fast forward to June, there's a 4% decrease in new plan creation. So we'll would just say there's that six month COVID window. It really kind of demonstrated plan revisions were the key. New, pl new plan creation was kind of flat or negative, but we believe the next six to 12 months, you're gonna see this massive influx of new client creations of new individuals that want to plan. And it goes to this point, and I've I heard this a few times, um, profitable clients, the mass affluent, the lower tier, they're going to come. This is the time. They're going to start asking for advice. They're going to start asking for planners. And we need to be ready for it. And I think the only way to solve that issue, and I, I think, I, I forget who mentioned this, is through technology and it's through being powered to make it simpler. Um, my concern is there's 300 and some thousand financial professionals in the United States and you add them on our 50, 60,000 in Canada. That population is not growing, but the investor population is going to grow significantly over the next mm -hmm. six to 12 months. So how can we take the technology, how can we take big data to power planning for all those individuals, right? Because they don't, they don't want just a self-directed, they don't want a robo, they could go there. If they're coming to you, they want more meaningful, they want more, something more meaningful. So how do you leverage smart assumptions, uh, 
big data and other ways to kind of democratize wealth management to anyone who seeks it, especially over the next, next six to 12 months or so. Yeah, I think I, mean, I, I love that point about making it simple. I was telling Lee, I didn't send you the article, Lee, and I will, I'll send it to everybody. You may have seen it last year. I think it was Craig Iskowitz. The title of the article is, We Built It and They Did Not Come. <laughs> you know, it was all about the, the tools that have been built are so complex and it's easy when you're in your lab, right? Developing these tools. This is great. Oh my God, we have it all covered. But then in real life on the front line, you just don't have time to get to it all the time. And um, um, there's ways, you know, to make it simpler and just get it started. That's the key, right? Get, yeah. get something started. Because a lot of what happens is a lot of advisors are overwhelmed and they never get started. And uh, yeah, that's no, not good for the advisor or the client, right? No, that's a good point. And we actually, so we track, you know, everyone tracks all of the, the buzzwords, right? From AI to big data to what's going to, like, what's going to impact your industry. And when we looked back, and this is pre-COVID, but also now post-COVID, we kind of went through all of them. And we said there was four, right? There is a dwindling advisor count. We believe in the next 20 years, we're going to lose a significant volume of our advisors, right? Um, we're going to see that transition of wealth, like we talked about, $30 trillion, whatever that number is. Um, so we're seeing this dwindling of advisors, but we're going to see an increase in investors. We're going to see an increase in the amount of people that want a financial plan, okay? Because they don't want an automated self-directed experience. They want something personal to them. So what we target is we identified kind of really four key elements that we believe will be the way of the future, technologically speaking. And I think this is validated with what Frank just said. Um, smart funding aligned through goal priority. So the idea is we truly want to help smart funding goal prioritization through saving strategies because as you add in newer, younger investors, there's going to be a much bigger impact around adding goals over time, you know, because we talked about one to two goals when there should be seven or eight. Um, we looked at smart assumptions, taking really big data and saying people like you, peers like you, because your advisors in the branches, your advisors in the field, your advisors virtually need to provide advice to more people. The only way to do that is through meaningful smart assumptions. It's to say people like you are doing this. This is what we think, and that can be changed later, but it helps you get to a plan faster. And uh, I'm going to go on record and say that I believe uh, shortly in the future, you're going to see a revolution around technology because as advisors leave their practice, as they leave the branches, they leave the banks, as they go off to the sunset and retire, we're gonna see this new swath of advisors that expect a stunning user experience, a stunning interface and a different way to interact with technology. So we need to be ready for that because they're coming and they're gonna desire something totally different than we offer today. And then finally that client experience. Someone uh, in the questions asked this question, they said, how many, you know, they'd like to see the difference between a client creating a plan versus an advisor and where it actually starts. We think, and you talked about, remember we talked about publishing portal plans to a portal. We think that's all going to blow up as well. We believe that the technology is going to be one and the same. Okay. It's going to be a shared client and advisor experience that actually looks and yeah. functions the same. And the only differences will be whether or not there's an entitlement set up based on if it's an advisor or not, but otherwise technologically, to be the same experience. We believe that's the way of the future too, because it's gonna be much more collaborative. It's gonna be much more client started or client initiated. But then when the advisor and client are interacting, they need to see the same thing. So we're seeing revolutions occur right in front of us. And we think COVID's accelerated that. So keep an eye out for that because technologically speaking, that's what we need to look for in the future. Off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much, Tony. That was really, I, I was excited to hear some of the things that you're talking about in your vision of the future. Good, thank you. Yeah, I wanna do, um, cause we're kind of kind of getting to the end here. We have a couple more minutes left. So let me share my screen for a moment. Um, let me get my technology working. There we go, okay. So what I did here today is I wanted to put together you know, some of the best practices that, you know, when I spoke to Frank, Noreen, and Paul, and Doug, you know, about some of the things that we wanted to have come out in today's meeting. Um, I also wanted, because I thought, oh, this would be good. Some of, we didn't get to everything, that no surprise there, right? But um, I also wanted to add a list of some of the coaching that I, you know, when I'm talking about advisor coaching, 
So and we heard a lot of that come out today, which was really exciting, right? Like Frank, do a plan for just start one, right? Just start it, start yeah. it with what you know. And then of course the one I love, one of the ones I love the most is just do a plan for the clients you wanna keep, right? So, um, so I, wanted, I wanted to share these with you. And then I wanted to wrap up to say, you know, we're here, you know, trying to and encouraging better adoption of this planning process. Um, I love the conversation today. Um, I wanna just offer this as an opportunity for y'all to participate in planning insights in the future. Um, give me a call if you wanna participate this year as well as next year to help you assess where you are, compare, see where you are relative to your peers. And then let's talk more about some best practices, again, just like we did here today, so that uh, we can help everybody move forward with planning. So at this point, I also want to let you know, I don't know if there were questions that were, um, we'll certainly, I think, need to follow up with some folks on some of the questions they had. Um, Tim, was there anything out there that you thought we should address today or do we just want to get back to those folks individually? No, I think uh, the, <clears throat> the direction that the conversation has gone in has done a great job of, um, um, of hitting on uh, most of the, the, the questions that we've, that we've gotten. <clears throat> Excellent. So Ken, Peter, anything that you wanted to add before we close out our meeting this afternoon? Run with it. <laughs> Peter? Yeah, I, I think this is the, the time to really use the Stephen Covey approach is to when you're planning for next year, don't just start with this year's baseline and try and build on that. When you're planning for next year, decide what you want planning to be for your business and then build your business around those results. Start with the end in mind next year instead of just incremental gains. Incremental gains won't get us there. Um, incremental gains is how we've handled insurance for the last 20 years. And we don't want this to be like insurance. Thank you, Peter. That, that's awesome. Thank you, Frank and Paul, Noreen, Tony. It was so ex exciting to hear from you. And Doug, thank you all for participating in our call today. We really appreciate it. We will be sending out, this is being recorded. We're gonna send it out to, to folks that weren't able to participate today. And please, you know, we would love to hear your feedback. How can we make this more useful um, or any other questions that you may have? So thank you Thanks all. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thanks all. Bye. Bye. Bye.